Hello and welcome to Budget with Business Standard. I am Nivedita Mukherjee. Three days to go for the union budget, things are warming up in New Delhi and the winter chill in the capital hasn't come in the way. As Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman and her A-team give a final glance over the budget speech, our show will capture the mood within and outside the government. We begin with an authoritative report on India's investment trajectory. Even as there are early signs of private investment recovery, will this trend continue? And will the budget help revive public and private investment? My colleague Asit Ranjan Mishra's report has quite a few answers. In the past two years, with the economy hit hard by successive waves of coronavirus pandemic, it was the government's capex push that saved the day for the economy. This was particularly crucial as capacity utilization had plummeted and private sector was reluctant to make any fresh investments. And now, any hope of early recovery in private investment has also been dashed by a third wave of the pandemic. Latest set of high-frequency data clearly depicts this vulnerability. For example, even before the Omicron variant caused any major damage in India, growth in eight infrastructure sectors dipped to a nine-month low at 3.1% in November. And PMI manufacturing slumped to a three-month low in December at 55.5. Sita Raman, who will present her budget in the thick of the third wave, is expected to stay on course and push for at least 6.5 trillion rupees in public expenditure for FY23, compared with 5.5 trillion in FY22. However, the sluggish trend in capex so far, with only 49% utilization by November last year, despite a 26% increase in allocation for FY22, has raised concerns amongst observers. The government is expected to continue to lay emphasis on national infrastructure pipeline and national monetization plan in the upcoming budget to both revive investment and augment government revenues. The Gati Shakti panel is expected to make the process of identification and monitoring of the infrastructure project under the national infrastructure pipeline more efficient and smooth. The Finance Minister is also expected to announce further fund infusion in the National Investment in Infrastructure Fund and National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development to bridge the funding gap in the infrastructure space. With REITs and INVITs gaining popularity as a vehicle of investment in assets in the infrastructure sector, even for PSUs, the government may incentivize these routes of investment. It may also reduce the holding period in REITs and INVITs to be classified as long-term investment from 36 months to 12 months on a par with listed securities. I think India needs an independent autonomous organization to handle PPPs. PPPs can't be carried on the shoulder of DA and Niti Aayog because they work differently and they are structured differently. We need professionalism, we need good quality independent expert, we also need flexibility so that 50% at least should be with the private sector. Now we have Aishman Bharat scheme as an insurance scheme and now we should leverage it to create uh, hospital infrastructure in tier 2 and tier 3 cities uh, using Ayushman Bharat insurance scheme. Same thing is on education and skills also. We should place create world class skill and education institute on PPPs to get the best advantage of India demographic dividend. In terms of uh, power, uh, I think the PLI scheme has been introduced in many of the renewable energy sector including solar etc. But there is a problem in the supply chain uh, and we need to give some PLIs and GST concession on supply chain also on entire value chain and suppliers uh, base for these renewables so that we can compete with many countries which are really dumping into India. Thank you. Given the high demand for digital infrastructure to deliver healthcare and education in the virtual mode, the government may also encourage private players to join hands with it to roll out broadband connectivity in the hinterland. The union budget may also announce measures to strengthen the public-private partnership dispute resolution mechanism, uniform PPP institutional framework, easier terms for infrastructure companies accessing bond markets and tax shops, 
As Sita Raman presents her fourth budget on February 1st, corporate India will keenly watch what more she does to unleash the animal spirits in the economy. Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman ji has given us four ends over the last 12 to 18 months in the field of infrastructure, the National Infrastructure Pipeline, the National Monetization Pipeline, the National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development, and the National Program in Policy Management Framework for building capacities that go into creating such infrastructure. So what to do is answered, how to finance it is answered, how to get the whole thing done and four things that we would like to see in the budget as focus. Number one, the four C's. Number one is coordination. Number two is capacity. Number three is contracts. And number four is confidence. Coordination between government of India, government of states, and government of cities where most of the infrastructure is going to be built. Capacity. NHAI has capacity to deliver 40 kilometers per day of highways. Can we get the same capacity in municipal bodies, in state governments. Number three is contracts. The biggest problem for Indian business is enforcement of contracts and dispute resolution. How can we go and create a construction law following the example of so many other successful countries so that prompt payments happen, prompt disputes uh, resolution happen, and in all the ease of doing business is much better. And finally, confidence. Private investment will come in after public investment lays the bulwark and foundation. The FM's message to India Inc. has been to show its animal spirits. The budget could show the way through public investments. Moving on to the next segment, our guest Amish Shah, Managing Director and Head of India Research at Bank of America, speaks to Puneet Wadwa on wide-ranging issues. From the implications of any interest rate hike by US Federal Reserve to demand stimulus in the budget. Listen in. Hello, Amish and welcome. Thank you, Puneet. Pleasure to be here. Uh, do you think that the US Fed outcome and the other global factors will be the driving force for the markets rather than the budget proposals? Yeah, Pune, the, you know, uh, so le- as we know that the Fed is already going through its meetings uh, and they have set the course for bringing forward uh, the rate hikes. Uh, you know, this is, this is critical because it moves the cost of equity valuation assumptions for a variety of firms. Uh, you know, uh, the easy liquidity of money obviously slows down that to some extent impacts growth as well. Uh, so I think markets will react to that. You know, this is an event that we had predicted for the year, uh, but just about a month back, the expectations at that point in time were that the hike will start from June, which is now brought forward. Uh, so markets will have to adjust to that new normal. Can the budget be a non-event for the markets then? Uh, you know, budget to a large extent has already become a smaller part as compared to history going, uh, you know, uh, the, and the reason for that obviously is that there are variety of issues that are now being addressed outside of the budget. Uh, but I would not call it as a complete non-event, especially in this year. This is the budget which is coming at a time where the government cannot work with higher fiscal deficit. There has to be some sort of fiscal consolidation because COVID-related issues are now broadly getting over. Along with the reduced fiscal deficit, there is also a clamor for demand stimulus, which is which the government has given in measured doses so far. So what kind of a fiscal deficit would the market be comfortable with? We are expecting a 100 basis point contraction in fiscal deficit uh, to go down from 6.8 to 5.8. Uh, that number, I would say, uh, you know, is in line to slight positive versus uh, consensus expectations. Broadly, uh, investors basis our conversation are expecting at least uh, 50, 60 basis points of uh, fiscal deficit contraction. So, you know, 100 basis point will be will be a positive news. Privatization, funds for public sector banks, capex push, all these are known uh, factors. Where, where can one expect some surprise? So demand stimulus, I think, is more of a uh, more of an ask right now, uh, but it is not like a given that the government would be able to provide. Uh, we do think that uh, the government may be able to provide around $20 billion of stimulus, uh, you know, $11 billion 
coming in the form of uh, tax cuts uh, and nine billion dollars coming in the form of subsidies. Uh, but more than that, the other uh, surprise uh, or the positive that I would take along is we do think that government will continue to improve the transparency of the budget, and uh, and uh, there is a there is a possibility that the demand stimulus comes in the form of tax reforms. Uh, you know, which is something that the government wants to do. They when they came up with the second option of uh, filing income taxes without deductions. Uh, you know, if they work on those lines, that will be definitely be considered as a positive because any any uh, demand stimulus to subsidies uh, is going to be considered more populist. But any demand stimulus stimulus through tax reforms uh, achieves both the goals of given uh, of giving a stimulus plus implementing reforms. The rural uh, economy, uh, the rural India, uh, continues to you know be not on a, as strong a footing as it was say a year ago. Do you think that the demand will actually come through? So, uh, you know, versus the expectations that we had built in, I think there is a need to readjust that, uh, you know, that downwards. So let's say I were to look at consumer stocks, I think uh, there is a need that earnings will get downgraded. Uh, but, uh, you know, from an economic momentum perspective, uh, you know, if the government continues with these subsidies or the tax cuts along with the CAPEX push, uh, you know, I think that helps, you know, because... If you think about, you know, while it sounds like CAPEX does not benefit the rural India, uh, you know, uh, there are plenty of rural focused infrastructure schemes uh, that the government works on and that does benefit. Schemes like Manrega or Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, which gives affordable housing, while the government provides for that as a revenue expenditure, the end result of these spends leads to capital creation, right? Uh, because if the government gives CLSs or credit link subsidy scheme, or for PMAY housing, uh, you know, somebody's buying a house on the back of that, or Manrega spends leads to some rural infrastructure creating on the back of that. So I think that to some extent, even the CAPEX uh, is uh, going to help recover or revive the rural economy over and above the obvious uh, subsidy-driven measures. What are the three or five sectors, according to you, that will benefit most from the budget proposals? I think purely from the budget, uh, you know, consumption, financials, industrials, these are the three sectors that benefit. Thanks, Amish, for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Amish Shah believes demand stimulus in the budget may come in the form of tax reforms, easy money flow will slow and that markets will have to adjust to the new normal. Also, the budget may focus on creating rural infrastructure, he says. And now changing tracks. Will this budget continue with the railway infrastructure plans? Tvesh Mishra finds out. The railway budget in 2022 will continue with its focus on infrastructure creation in line with the trend of recent years. Railway station redevelopment, improved train sets and some enhanced offerings like bullet train and hyperloop technology may figure in the finance minister's budget speech. The expansion of Vande Bharat train sets and more cargo-focused offerings are also likely to find a mention. This year's rail budget may see a total allocation of around 2.5 trillion rupees. This is around 20% higher than the 2.15 trillion rupees allocation in the previous year. This amount included a gross budgetary support of 1.07 trillion rupees in 2021-22. This is an allocation directly from the union government's coffers. The balance amount is to be generated from the extra budgetary resources at the disposal of Indian Railways. According to officials in the know, this year's gross budgetary support may be closer to 1.25 trillion rupees. The enhanced allocation is also supposed to cover up the loss that the national transporter has incurred due to the COVID-19 lockdowns. The resource gap is due to the fixed cost of Indian Railways such as wages and track maintenance being borne despite passenger revenues plummeting during the two financial years 2021 and 2122. The earnings from freight have increased in this period on account of speedier freight trains and higher goods loading. The Rail Ministry's target of electrifying all routes by December 2023 will also find a mention in the budget speech. There will be an enhanced allocation to ensure that the steep target is achieved. 
the plan to become a net zero emitter by 2030 will also figure in the union budget. An upward fare revision for passengers and freight is unlikely in the budget in light of key assembly elections in states dissuading any unpopular moves. The fund deployment is in line with the National Rail Plan 2030 that aims to create a future-ready railway system by 2030. The NRP is aimed to formulate strategies based on both operational capacities and commercial policy initiatives to increase modal share of railways in freight. The objective of the plan is to create capacity ahead of demand which in turn would cater to future growth in demand right up to 2050 and also increase the modal share of railways to 45% in freight traffic and to continue to sustain it. Even more emphasis in this budget will be to achieve the Vision 2024 portion of the National Rail Plan. This is for accelerated implementation of certain critical projects by 2024, such as 100% electrification, multi-tracking of congested routes, upgradation of speed on the delhi Howrah and Delhi-Mumbai routes to 160 km per hour, upgradation of speed on all golden quadrilateral, golden diagonal routes to 130 km per hour and elimination of all level crossings on these routes. It's true that infrastructure creation will be a driving force this budget, whether it's for bullet train, hyperloop technology or anything else. But let's look beyond all this for a bit to think about something unique related to budget. How about this? The 1997 Union Budget, also known as the Dream Budget because of its progressive taxation measures, was presented by P. Chidambaram on February 28th of that year as part of the United Front Government led by then Prime Minister H.D. Devigoda. As some of our viewers would remember, it was a shaky coalition propped up by outside support from the Congress. In the weeks following the budget, there was a political turmoil as the Congress, then led by Sita Ram Kesri, withdrew support, and the Devigora government collapsed in April 1997. However, coalition partners were keen to avoid midterm elections. A consensus was reached and the Congress was given a greater say in the coalition, even though it was not part of the government. It decided to support another United Front government this time with the then External Affairs Minister Indra Kumar Gujral as PM. By the time the budget was passed in May 1997, there was a new government. It was the only time in India's history that a budget was stabled by a government led by one Prime Minister and passed by a government led by another. Some more history here, this time associated with former President Pranab Mukherjee. Mukherjee is the only finance minister so far to have presented an interim budget before general elections and then a full budget immediately after. He did so in 2009 as Manmohan Singh government came back to power. You might think there would be more instances of the same FM presenting an interim budget and a full budget in the same year. After all, many governments have returned to power at the centre. But no, except in Mukherjee's case once, all governments retaining power have incidentally appointed a new FM to present the full budget. The last such example was of Piyush Goyal presenting the 2019 interim budget and then Nirmala Sitharaman presenting the full budget. Another unique practice that became part of the budget tradition is the halwa ceremony to mark the annual process. This time, halwa has been replaced with mithai in keeping with the COVID-19 protocol. That's all for today. See you on the budget day with an exciting show. Don't miss it for anything. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.